Thanks for joining us on Capital View. I'm Fred Martino. We have a very busy week this week, lots of news to get to, so I want to get right to, to it with Mawa Iqbal of WBEZ and Jason Pisha, director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. We have been talking a lot about the budget and the other bills that passed this year. So this week, we're gonna begin with the bills that did not pass. Very important not to forget about those. Jason, Capital News Illinois highlighted some of those bills. Give us an update. Sure. I mean, the session starts each spring in January. It seems like we have all the time in the world, world a full five months to get everything done. Uh, it seems like nothing happens for those first 4.8 months or so, 5.8 months and everything passes, including the budget in the last week or so. And that leaves a lot of important issues on the table that don't get dealt with, uh, with always a promise of perhaps we'll deal with it in the veto session. I uh, wanted to run through five quick ones today that, that sort of highlighted uh, sort of those missed opportunities. Uh, first was uh, involving the Prisoner Review Board. You may remember the tragic case from earlier this spring where a Chicago man, Rossetti Brand, uh, the Prisoner Review Board voted to parole him. Uh, and then, you know, within hours of being released, he went to his ex-partner's house and stabbed her and then fatally stabbed that woman's 11-year-old uh, son. Um, all this happened while uh, the victim had a uh, order of protection, uh, an emergency order of protection against him to keep uh, him away from her. Uh, this created lots of fallout in the PRB. A couple of members resigned uh, and Republicans introduced some legislation to cover up uh, the holes in the PRB system, including making members need some uh, enhanced qualifications to be on the board improving some notification measures to victims when people get out of prison. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't go anywhere. So uh, we'll see where it goes with the next few months. Um, there are also a couple of wage-related bills that uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, we've talked for several sessions about um, eliminating the sub-minimum wage for workers who have disabilities. Uh, there's an exemption in uh, the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act that allows businesses and rehabilitation and residential care centers to pay people with disabilities less than the minimum wage. This bill would have uh, eliminated the ability to do that. Uh, again, once again, that one didn't go anywhere. Uh, there was also another bill uh, to eliminate the uh, tipped wage. Uh, workers who are tipped, such as waiters and waitresses, um, the current minimum wage is $14 an hour for a couple more weeks here. Uh, waiters and waitresses can be paid as little, little as $8.40 an hour, as long as their tips make up the difference. Uh, this bill would have, uh, in, you know, deleted that eight forty dollars wage and made everyone pay at least $14. Uh, obviously, some restaurants and businesses oppose that uh, due to the increased costs. Um, also, a bill, uh, uh, Alexi Janilius, the Secretary of State, is also the state librarian, uh, was backing a bill that would have uh, increased penalties to people who make threats against libraries or librarians, making them equal to people who make threats against schools. Um, that bill didn't go anywhere this session as well. Uh, this bill comes a year after uh, the governor signed a bill that would have uh, cut off state grants to uh, libraries that, that ban books uh, for political reasons. Uh, all this has to do with uh, sort of the increased scrutiny on libraries uh, among the public on which books are allowed and which books are not allowed and sort of the political ramifications of that. Um, and then one other one, uh, we saw a, a news conference earlier in the session about uh, hemp-related uh, products, specifically the Delta-8 products. These are, uh, you know, products that are resemble snacks and cookies and other things that, that children might like. Uh, and they're, they can, they're unregulated. They're, they can be freely sold in convenience stores. Uh, and there was some talk about putting some regulations in place that would make it harder for these products to get in the hands of children. Uh, and that didn't go anywhere either. So we'll see where all these go. Absolutely important to uh, really keep track of all of those. That last one you mentioned, of course, uh, something that's receiving a lot of attention uh, in other states as well, a national issue. Mawa, uh, you reported 
on another bill that did not pass for a third time it failed to pass. It's called Karina's Law. We've covered it on this program and some other WSIU productions. Tell us about this and why it didn't pass again for a third time. Yeah, so Karina's bill is named after Karina Gonzalez, who is a woman in Chicago. She had sought an order of protection against her uh, domestic partner, citing threatening behavior and drug use, and was granted that order of protection. And the judge also issued the removal of his firearm or, or of his FOID card, but not the removal of his firearms. And so he um, then allegedly shot and killed Karina, as well as her 15-year-old daughter, and also harmed her son, Manny. And so this bill, um, yes, was introduced last spring, was for the first time. It uh, had support from Democrats, but it had a lot of pushback against police groups, with some police groups saying that this is, you know, it, it's, it puts police in a very dangerous situation to try to go and confiscate these guns in these domestic violence situations and, um, you know, Police groups are worried about just also the due process issues of like, you know, confiscating firearms from people who haven't been officially convicted of a crime. And so, you know, it, it failed in the spring. Um, but, you know, the, the Democratic supporters and sponsors of the bill thought, OK, let's bring it back for the veto session last fall. They brought it back and it failed once again. And of course, there is still at the same time all this momentum on the ground from domestic violence survivor groups, from gun control groups, um, violence prevention groups in general, who really, really wanted to see this bill come to fruition. And so they brought it back again for the third time this spring session, and it didn't even make it out of committee, much to the chagrin of a lot of the advocates who are on the ground supporting this. And when I talk to police groups, it's, it seems that as though those concerns that they had last year sort of remain still where it's a um, safety issue, right? That they were saying that, you know, for in order to execute a search and um, seizure of these firearms safely, police recommend that you have four officers do it. And then there's also the question of where do we keep the guns once we confiscate them? So a lot of these issues kind of revolve around the capacity for smaller departments in more rural areas, you know, like how do smaller departments who have maybe like one officer on duty do something like this? So. It's something that when I talked to the sponsor of this bill about, she said that she will come back in the summer and keep working on it. But I guess another wrench and in, in the plans, but kind of what makes this all so confusing also is the fact that there is a Supreme Court case up right now. It's um, called the Rahimi case. And it's after this person in Texas who similarly also went on a kind of a shooting rampage after he had a domestic violence order protection taken out against him. And so the question that's now before the U.S. Supreme Court is, would it violate people's Second Amendment rights to bear arms to order the confiscation of these guns if you have a, a order protection against you? And so we don't know when that decision will come down. People say it'll be sometime this summer, but the chief sponsor of this bill of Karina's law definitely said, we will have to make sure and see what happens with that before we can move forward. Legal matters, always uh, complicated and a very good overview there that there's also perhaps a, a funding issue because of uh, if you have a new law, you also have to have the means to enforce the law. But certainly something we will continue to watch here at Capitol View and on other uh, WSIU uh, programs. Jason, a new report this week in the Sun-Times shows that Chicago's homeless population has tripled the immigration crisis being blamed for part of that. And another story in the Chicago Tribune discussing the problem of immigrant men disappearing, leaving women and children with another crisis in addition to building a new life in America. Uh, bring us an update. Yeah, uh, first the Sun Times story. Uh, each year, the city of Chicago does sort of a snapshot uh, count of the homeless population in the city. Uh, they did the count this year in late January, uh, and they came up with uh, almost 19,000 people experiencing homel homelessness on that one night in Chicago. Uh, almost 14,000 of them uh, were classified as asylum seekers, uh, you know, living in shelters. 
about 5,000 of them were non-asylum seekers, which was a, just a, a 25% increase on just non-asylum seekers. And as you mentioned, uh, the overall number was was triple of what it was last year. Um, you know, this obviously comes as the uh, migrant crisis uh, continued to build throughout all of last year and into this year. Um, somewhat of, of 43,000 migrants entered Chicago over uh, the last several months. Um, you know, and at the same time, uh, the, the experts in, in the story in, indicated that um, uh, lots of pandemic-related relief aid has started to run out, uh, which uh, decreased abilities for uh, uh, cities and governments to to, to deal with this. Um, and at the same time, there's some you know policy changes, or at least attempted policy changes in Chicago. Some have worked, some have not. Um, you may remember in the March election, um, the Chicago mayor put out a plan that would have increased taxes on uh, high-end property sales uh, and and direct those proceeds to combating the homeless situation in Chicago. Uh, voters rejected that soundly, so that didn't go anywhere. Uh, but at the same time, the mayor is trying some other uh, financial uh, solutions to try to direct some more money toward homelessness. And as uh, probably been mentioned on an earlier show, the state budget that was signed uh, recently uh, includes $182 million in state money uh, to help with the migrant population in Chicago. Um, so that's all there. And then you mentioned the Chicago Tribune story as well. Uh, interesting story by Nell Salzman of the Tribune. Looking at, I'm not sure you can call it a trend, uh, but she found uh, a few cases of where you know migrant families are, are landing in Chicago, perhaps unexpectedly, and they're just trying to make their lives work. Uh, so uh, you know, a, a man and his partner, or a man and his wife, and then some children arrive here. They're they're looking for work. They're trying to establish their lives, um, and it's undoubtedly a challenge. And uh, Nell's story gets into some details about how. Uh, the men uh, in these families um, are abandoning their families, leaving their wives, leaving their children, and, and sort of going off. And and we're not sure where they're going. In some cases, they uh, may be being treated as missing persons cases, or, or maybe they're just gone. Um, yeah. And it's important, as you know, to say we don't know yet the context in terms of is this percentage higher uh, than it than it would normally be uh, in in general. We simply don't don't know that, and the the numbers are staggering to uh, to say the least. That uh, it's over forty thousand immigrants who have uh, come into Chicago since August of 2022, which is the number that's used in many stories on uh, the immigration issue. Yeah. And there's just one last note on that uh, Nell Salzman story from the Tribune. Uh, they talked to some counselors who who work with these families and, you know, they mentioned it just might be a pride issue. Uh, the men are having problems finding jobs and just because they're unable to provide for their families, they may feel a sense of shame and may uh, just walk away. So it's a sad story um, uh, nonetheless. Absolutely. We will, again, continue to watch uh, that issue very closely. Mawa, I want to move to politics now. We have only about 12 minutes left in the show. And this is a very important and interesting story you covered for WBEZ. Ranked choice voting is being added across the country. Tell us more about ranked choice voting as it may come to Illinois someday. Yeah, so it's really interesting that this is something that's been talked about, at least, you know, for the past couple of sessions. Uh, last spring, there was an effort to bring, actually bring ranked choice voting into Illinois for the 2028 presidential elections. And there was a lot of pushback from local election authorities, like county clerks, and then also the state board of elections who were like, you know, we, we just need more time to really think about like how to actually transition to this completely different style of voting. And so uh, the compromise then became, you know, let, let's convene a task force instead. And so this task force had met, um, I believe they're done meeting and now they're in the process of drafting a report on what they think the state should do. But essentially ranked choice voting, for those of you who don't know, is uh, when you go to the polls and instead of picking one 
person, you rank however many candidates there are, you know, out of um, however many candidates there are. And so the candidates that get the top rankings advance on, if there is, you know, a runoff that needs to happen because not one candidate has reached 50% or more of the votes, then the whoever, all the ballots for the bottom two candidates, they get eliminated. And then the the people who put whatever their second choice was will go up to the the top. So it's it's a little confusing and kind of convoluted, but it's, you know, proponents say that it definitely helps in regards to making the elections more, um, I guess, civil in a way. So, so they said that because the field is more crowded and you aren't picking just one person, you're trying to appeal to multiple different voter bases to try to get either the first or the second or third rankings from voters, the elections and the campaigns become more policy focused instead of trying to mud, you know, mud slang or like smear the other, your opponent. Um, of course, opponents though of, of ranked choice voting say that money is is at the heart of the issue, right? So they're, they're saying that you know, we don't have the money to transition to new ballot counting systems, and we also would need more money to print larger, uh, you know, ballot sheets because um, the, it will take up more space on the ballot sheet itself. We'll also need to hire more um, election judges because there'll probably be longer lines since more people will be confused and, and need more help and may take more time at the polls themselves. So, it's it, there seems to be some like logistical concerns that need to be worked out, but overall, it does seem like most of the Democrats um, really like ranked choice voting and could probably see it coming in 2028. It's just, I guess, trying to convince the, the local um, election authorities to get on board, too, which. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. I moved here from a city that used ranked choice voting, and there was a lot of controversy before it was implemented and after it was implemented. But uh, certainly uh, there, there are many, many interesting uh, benefits that many advocates will mention, including what you said, the, the opportunity for a runoff if you have uh, two folks who simply don't get uh, 50% uh, of the vote. Some advocates consider that a benefit that you, you might have uh, the two most popular people uh, running against each other rather than simply one party versus another party. So it does, it does put the focus on policies. Uh, Jason, we're going to move to justice issues now, and a report in the Chicago Tribune finds black Chicago drivers are more likely to be stopped by police than to get traffic camera tickets. Give us the details. Yeah, this story in the Tribune reported on a study that uh, some university people did, uh, including at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, the data is a little bit old from 2019, but still uh, revealed some interesting things. Um, they looked at uh, GPS data from cell phones and data on traffic stops and speed cameras. Um, as you know, in Chicago, there's a couple of ways you can get a speeding ticket. Uh, there's the traditional way of a police officer observing you going too fast, and then they pull you over and do a traffic stop. Uh, but then they also have these speed cameras in Chicago that, uh, um, you know, detect your speed and then take a picture of your license plate and then mail you a ticket in the mail. Uh, they looked at, you know, who got speed tickets from officers and who got them from the cameras. And, uh, you know, reading from the story here now, just to give you the, the stats, uh, they found on a street where half the drivers were white. The probability of a white driver getting a traffic camera ticket was under 50%, uh, while white drivers made up on average fewer than 20% of actually getting stopped by police. Uh, and then on a street where half the drivers were black, uh, again, uh, about black drivers got about half of the camera tickets, but the actual police stops uh, amounted to about 70%. Uh, so the researchers mentioned, you know, there's some clear uh, at least from the data, showing there's some clear police bias on, on pulling over black drivers uh, at a higher rate than white drivers on some of these streets. Uh, this isn't a new issue. Um, state agencies put out uh, traffic stop data for uh, police departments all over the state. And when they first started doing this, we saw uh, some great disparities uh, racially in the numbers of people pulled over for traffic violations. Um, as more awareness has come to this, um, 
I think those numbers have evened out a little bit. But again, this new study sort of sheds some new light on it. Um, and it also, you know, there's also an issue with the police speed cameras as well. Um, there's been studies that show, uh, you know, these cameras are put in uh, neighborhoods that are that are more racially diverse um, and may un unfairly target th those populations as well. Um, so interesting to look at. And uh, the police say, the Chicago police say, you know, they're not uh, pulling over more black people on purpose, but they're they're interested in seeing the stats and they're always interested in training and, and getting better. A very important reporting and uh, very interesting as well. It will be interesting to see as more uh, recent data is examined uh, to, to get an update uh, on that. Mawa, uh, speaking of police, as Chicago gets ready for the Democratic National Convention in August, uh, we are being assured it will not be a repeat of 1968. That is in a story by the Chicago Tribune. Tell us more about this. Yeah, so what they're referring to to 1968 was uh, the 1968 Democratic National Convention that was in Chicago as well. And that convention was marked by mass protests and police riots uh, of, of people who were there to speak out against the US's involvement in the Vietnam War. And so what's happening this year is that there are uh, anticipated to be tens of thousands of people coming to Chicago to protest Biden's um, and the U.S.'s involvement in the Israel-Hamas war and Biden, uh, you know, not calling for a permanent ceasefire. And so it's it'll be interesting to see, you know, like how police respond to that, because so far the police have kind of, you know, put on this, you know, sort of where, where we have everything under control. It's not going to be like 1968. There will be no police riots, you know, we'll be better equipped and more trained to handle it. But of course, you know, it's it's a lot of it's you know, and what the Chicago Tribune article talked about. A lot of it does come down to optics. Right. So like the governor, um, J.B. Pritzker, you know, did a lot to get the DNC to come to Chicago. And so, of course, you know, trying to keep up a good sort of image that like everything will be under control is, is I think what, what they're hoping you know, to do. It's just, it'll be interesting to see if that truly is what happens. Because there are many, many groups who have vowed to violate city permits to come and protest um, and to really make their their voices heard. And it also kind of mirrors what's the, the schism that's being presented in the Democratic Party itself, but more progressive um, lawmakers calling on Biden to order or, or issue it uh, or call for a ceasefire, basically. So, yes. Very interesting. Uh, it, it will be fascinating to see uh, the activity at the convention and also uh, what becomes of the protests, because as you indicated, there are many uh, that have been announced and planned. Jason, our final story, we have uh, just about three minutes left. We're going to move to the economy. Uh, Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker is in Canada this week. A memorandum of understanding, uh, MOU, was signed with Canada. It's a very important trading partner. Uh, bring us up to date. Yeah, as you mentioned, the governor's been in uh, Toronto all week or Ontario all week to uh, speak at the U.S.-Canada summit. Uh, and it sort of came to a head yesterday, or I'm sorry, as we're taping this on uh on Wednesday, on, it happened on Tuesday, uh, to uh, sign a, as you mentioned, a memorandum of understanding with uh, the Ontario Premier Doug Ford uh, between the two governments, uh, sort of an agreement to uh, continue working together on trade, um, you know, uh, cooperating on uh, business missions, sharing market information, and, and promoting investment. Um, it's uh, interesting. They're, they're they're strong trading partners already. Um, Ontario is Illinois' second largest export market, and Illinois is Ontario's fourth largest export market in the U.S., so things you might not expect. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where, where this goes, but, um, you know, there's already a strong uh, relationship between the province and the state, uh, so it'll be good to, to, to continue that. I was very surprised, Jason, at the amount of money that we're 
uh, talking about uh, Illinois, uh, the top trading, uh, a top trading partner with Canada, and the number in a press release for 2022 was 92 billion dollars in bilateral trade, um, and that press release also said that Illinois exports increased. 30 percent between 2021 and 2022. Again, I want to make clear that was in a press release. Um, but the numbers continue certainly to be to be strong and global trade is incredibly important. Do you expect this politically to become more and more fraught, though, with, uh, you know, President Biden announcing um, a 100% tax, for instance, on electric cars produced in China. Um, yes, there's always that possibility, but um, I think from a political standpoint, I think the U.S. or at least Illinois and Canada are already uh, pretty friendly, which is uh, different than the relationship between the U.S. and China. Um, and even uh, during his uh, appearances in, in Canada this week, um, the governor, our, our governor, went into some political issues talking about how Illinois is, uh, you know, a, a haven for women's rights and civil rights and voting rights and LGBTQ plus rights, uh, yeah. sort of mirroring some of the policies in Canada. So uh, there's 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 some already some working together politically there right. as well. It's not there in China. All right. Jason and Malwa, thank you both for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for being with us at home. Capital View returns on June 27th. Next Thursday night at 7, join us for a special documentary, Carbondale, The Little Blue Dot. That's next Thursday night at 7. For everyone at WSIU, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week.